welcome. Trust you all had a great Christmas. And we are looking forward to worshiping God together. So people of God, feel the presence of God right now in this place. Warming your hearts, forgiving your fears and strife, preparing you for joyful service. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are beloved and forgiven. Will you please stand for the call to worship? Praise the Lord, all the earth, from the highest heights to the deepest depths. Praise the Lord, all the heavens and the starry host. Come, let us joyfully praise God. Amen. Amen. Please be seated as we go to God in prayer. We pray in unison. Together. God who walks with each one of us, help us to place our trust in your guiding care for us as we gather to learn the great lessons of living in peaceful community with each other. Open our hearts this day, Lord, to understand your loving presence and your challenge to us. Prepare us to be witnesses of your love and forgiveness. Make us ready to serve you in this world. Make us ready to work for you in your creation. For we ask this in the name of Jesus, your beloved Son. Amen. United Choir, and I think today we have just one representative from the United Choir who will be leading the singing, Brother Ralph. Um, but we join with him in the singing of the hymn, Angels from the Realms of Glory. And Brother Ralph will lead us, and we will sing along with him. Good morning, everybody. Merry belated Christmas to you people. So we're here to praise the Lord together. Amen? Amen. Yes. Angels from the realms of glory Wing your flight all the earth Ye who sang creation story now proclaim Messiah's birth come and worship come and worship worship Christ the newborn King shepherds in the fields abiding watching over flocks by night God with man is now residing, yonder shines the infant light. Come and worship, come and worship, worship Christ the newborn King. Sages, leave your contemplation. Brighter visions beam afar. Seek the great desire of nations. Ye have seen his natal star. Come and worship, come and worship. Worship Christ the newborn King. Saints before the altar bending, watching long in hope and fear. Suddenly the Lord descending in his temple shall appear. 
Come and worship, come and worship, worship Christ the newborn King. Amen. Praise God. Please be seated, except for the children and teachers going down to Sunday school. You can take this moment and leave for Sunday school, children and teachers who are going down for Sunday school downstairs. Leave at this time. We turn to the reading of scripture for today, Matthew chapter 1. We're going to read verses 18 through 25. Matthew 1, verses 18 through 25. And for the reading of the gospel. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph. But before they lived together. She was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph. Being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son. And you are to name him Jesus. For he will save his people from their sins. All this took place. To fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord. Through the prophet. Look. The virgin shall conceive and bear a son. And they shall name him Emmanuel. Which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had born a son. And he named him Jesus. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. I believe this one must be a solo, O Holy Night. Oh. <laughs> the words will be up there. We are, sing, we are to sing with you. Oh boy, I know that's, that hymn has some range that ordinary mortals like myself can't do, but we will try. O Holy Night. Uh, you're going to help? Come, come, help? come and help, Monica. Monica, thank you very much. Monica is coming to assist. And we will stand and, and join Monica and Ozzy. And thank you so much. And Brother Ralph, as the lead in the singing of O Holy Night. O Holy Night. Do we have some microphones to assist them? I know this is sudden. Um, and the assistance with the microphone to right so bless the lord take it away musicians Brightly shining, it is the night of our dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appears and the soul felt its worth. A thrill of hope. 
the weary world rejoices for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn fall on your knees oh hear the angel's voice oh night divine oh night when Christ was born oh gospel is peace. Change shall he break for a slave is our brother and in his name all oppression shall cease. Sweet hymns of joy in grateful chorus raise we let all Praise His holy name, Christ is the Lord. Oh, praise His name forever, His power and glory. We're more proclaimed. His cradle we stand, so led by light of stars sweetly gleaming, here comes a wise man from Orient land, the King of Kings led us in lowly manger in all our child born to be our friend he knows our need to all weakness a stranger behold your king behold in lowly Congregation, I mean, a choir can do it. <laughs> a choir can do it, but I don't think I've heard a congregation do it. And so that, that was special that the congregation could join in the singing of O Holy Night. That is, that is really special. It was always a choir piece or a congregational piece. We give God praise. We want to look at this song, not this song, but this subject, 
Give God your fears. Give God your fears. And we are going to use as a subject for reflection. Give God your fears. Think about that. And the text that will inform that reflection is Matthew 1, 18 through 25. Matthew 1, 18 through 25. I just want us to pause for a moment as we ask God to be with us to guide our thinking and our reflection. Speak, O oh God, your word to us in this moment of reflection. Speak a word that will bless our hearts. Speak so that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts will be acceptable in your sight. God, our strength, our redeemer. I always say that whenever you go to scripture, even though you're looking at a text which you might say is beat up, you hear it time and time again, you can almost recite it. And yet it is the nature of God. Every time we go to a familiar text to show us something new and to show us something fresh. And we are trusting God today as we look at this very familiar passage to show us something new and to show us something fresh that will speak to us in our contemporary situation. Because when we talk about the inspiration of scripture, this is one of the things we mean. The ability of the scripture to speak to you it was written centuries ago, many different writers, guided and inspired by God, but it has the ability to speak to you today. And when we talk about the inspiration of scripture, that's what we mean. It speaks to you in your context. And one of the great themes that is addressed by the Christmas story is the theme of fear. We know fear. The reason the church looks this way today is because people are afraid to catch the virus. We know fear. We fear, we fear losing our jobs. We, we fear getting bad news from the doctor. In this country today, we fear for the future of democracy. Um, in this country today, today, we fear that sometimes people who are put in charge are not truly interested in the well-being of their constituents. We know what fear is. And God, God addresses the, the question of fear through his messengers, the angels. And God speaks two words if you are reading the King James Version. Three words if you are reading the New Revised Standard Version. And those words are fear not for the King James Version. And do not be afraid for the New Revised Standard Version. And God through his messenger speaks those words in the Christmas story many times. Yes, but also many times throughout scripture, as a matter of fact, at least 365 times, those words, fear not, are mentioned in scripture. But let's look at those fear nots in the Christmas story. First, we have Matthew 1 and verse 20. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. That's the first fear not. The first do not be afraid. They mean the same thing. And here's our next fear not. Luke 1. In the Christmas story, Luke 1 and 13. But the angel of the Lord said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah, fear not, for your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you will name him John. Another fear not, spoken in the Christmas story. And then yet another one in the, the Christmas story. This one was spoken to Mary. Yeah? The angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. Fear not, for you have found favor with God. 
I'm saying that the, the theme of fear is addressed in the Christmas story. And in the Christmas story, these fear nots address the human situation in some very profound ways. In life, we become fearful about many things. And Christmas, why is, why is the theme of fear why is the theme of fear addressed like that in the Christmas story? You ever asked a question? Why is it that the theme of fear is addressed in so many ways in the, in the Christmas story? Well, Christmas is about God showing up to intervene and to help us conquer our fear. Christmas is about God showing up to intervene and to help us conquer our fear. Listen to one of the other fear knots in, in the Christmas story. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. Ah, in a world where all you're hearing is bad news. Christmas is about God showing up to tell you, Don't be afraid. I have better news than you're expecting. So now let us look at the fear knot that was spoken to Joseph and see how that fear not speaks to our contemporary situation. I'm saying this is what we're going to do. We have a lot of fear nots spoken in the Christmas story. And we are saying that God deliberately addressed the question of fear in the, Christians, in the Christmas story. We're going to look at the fear not that was spoken to Joseph and see how that one addresses our contemporary situation. Because Joseph learned a lot about dealing with fear, you know, in this episode. And we can learn from him. So first of all, point number one. The fear not spoken to Joseph. Speak to us in times when people let us down. Speak to us in times when people let us down. Anybody ever let you down? Matthew 1 and verse 20. Let's read that again. Matthew 1 and verse 20. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child con he conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Yes. You know, people let you down. You feel let down in life. And often, if we had all the facts... We would not write people off so quickly, you know. Our tendency is to write people off when they let us down, you know. You know, we say, I wash my hand, I done with that. Because that is a good for nothing. And we say some other choice words. And we write people off. But even in the worst of human situations, there is usually some redeeming feature. That even if it is not immediately apparent, will show up eventually when you have had time for reflection and to gather some more facts. As somebody much wiser than myself said, there is so much good in the worst of us. And the, the opposite is true too. There's so much bad in the best of us. And so if that is true, we have to go through life with a measure of humility. Not so? No wonder Jesus warned us against judging others. He said, judge not, so that you will not be judged. You know that I didn't make that up? Matthew 7 and verse 1. I hope I have the right passage. Yes, do not judge, so that you may not be judged. Jesus knows what he's talking about. Do not judge. You will not be judged. Joseph concluded that Mary was immoral and he was wrong. You see, we are looking at how the story speaks to us. Inspiration of scripture, you know. This happened to Joseph. Joseph. But we are looking at how the story speaks to us, how it speaks to you, how it speaks to Hugh Hamilton. Joseph concluded Mary had been immoral and he was wrong. But listen, he was convinced he was right though. We often come to the wrong conclusions about what is going on. And the, the Christmas story warns us about being hasty in judgment and forming Conclusions. Well, while Joseph was worrying, 
God was using the same worrisome circumstances to work out a wonderful plan for Joseph's life. You know, you know that him, God works in a mysterious way. His wonders to perform. His God is awesome. In that sometimes the things we think are going to kill us are the very things that this God uses to lift us. The things we think that we can't survive, that are going to destroy us, this God uses us, uses those things to lift us. You see, Joseph didn't know that the very things he wanted to leave his wife for were the things that God was going to use to bless them with. Mary was not immoral. She was the prophesied virgin with a child that, that Isaiah, one of the most respected prophets, Isaiah of old, had prophesied about what Joseph thought was sinful was in fact sacred. Judge not so that you will not be judged. I wonder if I'm talking to somebody today. He did not have all the facts, just like us sometimes. We know that we know that we know when we don't have all the facts and when we get the facts, we say, ah, oh, we never know. Of course you never know, you're not God. Fear not. Was spoken to Joseph and it spoke to Joseph and those words fear not tell us that we must stop fretting about the failures of others and we must let the judge of the earth retain his position as God and judge supreme sometimes we want to take over God work as if God retire God retire and make us judge of all the earth we know who good, we know who bad, we know who going to hell, and who going to heaven. And every member of our family going to heaven except the one who mashed your corn yesterday. But the fear not spoken here is telling us, stop worrying and address what you know. And trust God with what you don't know. Fear not. Do not be afraid. You know, the psalmist, and I like to read the psalms, you know, but I'm going to tell you something about the psalms. The psalmist are unapologetic about asking God to destroy the enemies. You know. they, they don't apologize for that. They want God to destroy the enemies. But one of the psalmists, had an amazing moment of insight in Psalm 37, 1 to 4, when he thought about people who let him down and when he thought about people who, who hurt him. This is what the Spirit of God said to him, that he's saying to us. Let's read those words. Do not fret because of the wicked. Do not be envious of wrongdoers. But they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. So you will live in the land and enjoy security. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. You know that is amazing insight for somebody like the psalmist? Because when people hurt us, instead of looking for revenge, instead of wishing them the worst. And instead of trying to do them back and get equal, we are encouraged by God to do good still. To do the right thing still. And yes, this is there too. We can't ignore this. You don't have to be the judge. All you have to do is wait. God will do God's thing, but you don't have to be judged. Your responsibility is to do good. So fear not. When people let you down, when people let you down, people hurt you, 
Fear not. Trust God. Still do good. And in, as I said in another place, wait on the Lord. Because God knows best. So this fear not that was spoken to Joseph. Speak to us in times when, when people let us down. But secondly, let me point this out. This fear not speaks to us when we are worried about public opinion. When we are worried about public opinion. Why, why am I saying that and where we get that? Even before we look at 20 again, because we look at 20 already. Let's look at verse 19. Verse 19. Let's look at that one. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. He was having his issues. But he was especially concerned about public opinion. Joseph was not willing to make Mary a public example. He did not want Mary to be destroyed for her supposed sin. And for this, the Bible describes him as a just man. Uh, and because it is not a godly quality to shame people. Some people think, you know, um, if I pull them down a peg or two, then, then that's, you, that's you trying to be God, right? I'll pull them down, I'll show them a thing or two. But it, it's, not, it's not a godly quality to shame people. And I always like to point people to, to how the Bible in Genesis portrays original sin. When Adam and Eve sinned, they felt shame. And they covered themselves with fig leaves. But we have God showing up. And in God's character, what God does, God clothes them with the skin of an animal. God covers our shame. That's how God operates. And so we shouldn't want to shame people and think that that is godly. Yes, Joseph wanted to cover her shame, but he was determined, yes, to get rid of her. Until the angel spoke to him. At that point, he decided that he was not going to let public opinion shape the future, but that he would let the word of God do that. I wonder if I'm talking to somebody today. What should shape your future? Public opinion or the word of God? I believe so. Very often, even in politics in the highest realm today, people are more concerned with the opinion polls than doing what is right by their constituents, by their country. People are more concerned about public opinion than doing justice, loving kindness, and walking humbly with their God. People are consumed by public opinion. And that is what holds the order of the day. Now this is how Joseph is remarkable. And shows us how to deal with fears. Let the word of God shape your future rather than public opinion. How we get that in the story? He, meaning Joseph, could have chosen... To let the fear of what other people would say shape his future. But the word of God spoken by the angel is what he chose to shape his future. We are told, listen, he was determined to get rid of this woman, you know. But God spoke to him. And what he did? He did the complete opposite. That's the experience of God speaking to him. He did the complete opposite of what he had resolved to do in his own heart. Well, how is that speaking to me? And how is that speaking to you? Our responsibility is to do what God wants us to do and be what God wants us to be. You're going to always have public opinion. You're going to always have that. You're going to always have the opinion of your friends. But Thanks be to God, you will also have truth, you know. And the fear of public opinion 
can keep us from doing and being God's best. And the fear of public opinion can make us want to bury truth. But you know what? One thing you can't bury is truth, you know. Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. They lock him up in a tomb, you know, but three days after, what happened after? Three days. You can't bury truth. It's going to raise up and bite you. Times you don't expect it to. And it rise up and manifest. In ways that you can't imagine. Proverbs 29 and verse 25 talks about public opinion. You know. It says, The fear of others lay a snare, but the one who trusts in the Lord is secure. You know why that is important? Public opinion change, you know. The same family member who tell you something last week, this week they change their position, you know. They tell you this week do something opposite what they tell you last week. And this is why integrity is measured not by public opinion but by the word of God. David said, Thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. You know, I didn't make that up. It's Psalm 119 and verse 11. Now we can watch it. Psalm 119 verse 11. Yeah, this is a new revised standard version. It says, I treasure your word in my heart so that I may not sin against you. Notice, he did not say, public opinion I have embraced that I might do right. Ah. There were a lot of people doing wrong because... What motivates them and moves them is public opinion. No, that which the psalmist was holding on to, to help him do right, was the word of God. And we are saying that in this story, Joseph chose to go the way of the word of God. To do right and to overcome his fears. We normally say, well, if we're going with the majority, we feel good. But you know, really, when it comes to God, you know, the majority is God and one. Those people who are doing God's will do not need to fear public opinion. That's what that text from Proverbs says. Imagine some people refuse to make a commitment to Christ because they are afraid of what other people will say. Public opinion have a lot of influence, you know. And Joseph is telling us, stop living your life by public opinion and give the word of God a chance. Oh my Lord, so many of us, is what people say that matters. What about this? Give the word of God a chance. Public opinion will let you down eventually. Jesus found that out, you know. Because some people who were shouting Hosanna one week, you know where they shout next week? That's, that's public opinion for you. It changes. It is fickle. But you know what? The word says, the word of God abides forever. It will never let you down. Public opinion will change. But the word of God abides forever. Jesus reminded us that heaven and earth will pass away before God's word falls to the ground. So what's going to shape your future? Public opinion. In times of worry and fear, we need to trust the word of God over public opinion. And Joseph teaches us this vital truth, and it made him strong. 
public opinion say, get, get back at them. The word of God says, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Public opinion say, do unto them before they do unto you. The word of God says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Public opinion says, call them out before they call you. The word of God says, judge not so that you will not be judged. Public opinion says, leave them to fry in their own fat. The word of God says, bear one another's burdens. Yes, the Ten Commandments, they are the word of the Lord. Love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. That's the word of the Lord. And the best measure of integrity is the word of God. And it's something far more reliable than public opinion. And Joseph shows us that in his decision to listen to the angel. I wonder if I'm talking to somebody today. I wonder if I'm talking to somebody who's wrestling with public opinion. I'm wondering whether I should follow the word of God. Whether I should follow public opinion. Well, let me say that finally, one of the ways in which one of the times in which this fear not, this particular fear not, spoken to Joseph, speaks to us, is in times of mental and emotional anguish. You're going to have some of that in life. And if you've never had mental and emotional anguish, don't worry. All you have to do is live long enough. It will show up. And sometimes, in this mental and emotional anguish, you have to deal with it in the stark loneliness of your own soul. Did you, did you read in the passage that Joseph discussed this with anybody? You see it there. Although I would encourage you, if you have a trusted friend, talk with a trusted friend. But I also know there are some stuff you have to deal with. You can't even discuss it with a and it's those moments where you have to go into the sacred council of Yahweh where you have to go into a sacred space, a quiet space and let God speak to you and when God speaks to your spirit you find resolution and when you find that resolution, you know you're on the path that God chooses. When the angel spoke with Joseph, he was no longer worried about public opinion. God had spoken. And so this fear not. For times when you, you, you have reached a place of, of anguish, and there's none that you can turn to. But when you reach a place of resolution, it's usually because you have been thinking about something for a while. And Joseph was worried sick about this matter. Sometimes we got decisions to make. And I want to tell you one of the things we do. It is not necessarily a good method. We talk to 10 people. And if six say go right, and four say go left, your decision is go right. Sometimes that's not it, you know. Sometimes you just need to spend enough time with God. And I don't know where's your sacred space. Some people's sacred space is by the seaside. I like to go by the seaside. That's what I do every year when I get the opportunity. 
I go by the seaside and I recharge. I recharge. But can you imagine the state of of mind that Joseph was in during this emotional crisis? But what I want to guess to get at is that God has a way of intervening in our fears and doing for us exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think. And he thought that all fall down, you know. It's when God was lifting. And especially when we reach the place where we can say, have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. When we reach that place, we know we're on the right track. When Joseph reached that place, he found out that his anxiety was without foundation. And I want to tell you something about us, you know. A lot of the things we fear would happen don't happen, you know. Uh, a lot of our fears are without foundation. What's going to happen to me? Will my pension money last? Will they still have social security by the time I reach to collect? But God said, God said, look at the birds. You think they're worrying about where they're getting their next morsel? And God always provides. We worry about a lot of stuff we don't have to worry about. We fear a lot of stuff we don't have to fear. And in Joseph's case, what he thought would bring death would in fact bring deliverance. And what he thought would ruin Mary, in fact, immortalized her name. He thought people would call Mary bad. Instead, they call her blessed. And many of the things we think, as I said, will kill us are the things that save us. And in those vital truths lives a far more vital truth. Many are the fears you have. You don't need them. Give them to God. And these words are not mine, but you know them well. Whoever coined them, they did the human family a great service. Let go and let God. Let go of your fears and let God be God. God said, or the word of God says, Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. So, instead of your fears, let your mind dwell on the awesome power and might and love and grace of a wonderful God who in spite of all your sins, has your very best interest at heart. And you will have that promised peace. This, this awesome God, who long before you could imagine, already hooked up the means of your deliverance, you can give him those fears because he has eternity in view. We are reminded in our Bible study that sometimes when we look up at the sky and we see stars shining, we say, oh gosh, look how stars shine bright tonight. But it took millions of years for that starlight to reach your eyes. That awesome God knew before you ever saw that starlit night that you were going to witness that starlit night. And you see all those fears that you have? This awesome God knows about them and has already taken care of them. 
I don't know what your fears are today. But all of us have some. But in the Christmas story, Joseph heard, I fear not. I do not be afraid. That took him from a place of despair to a place of faith. I fear not. I do not be afraid that took him from a place of anxiety to a place of peace. Am I going to have to spend the rest of my life alone to give that fear to God? And that fear not is for times when we have been let down. God bless you if nobody never let you down, but all you have to do is live long enough. That fear not is for times when we worry about public opinion. That fear not is for times of mental anguish where we're dealing with our own pain. And everybody judge you. And everybody call you good for nothing. And you ain't got nobody to discuss the problem with. You got to go to God and in the secret, sacred counsel of Yahweh, in the stark loneliness of your own soul, you talk to God about it. That fear not is for times like that. And so this Christmas season, as we look at our sermon title, give God your fears. Give God your fears. When you have no one to turn to, give God your fears. And whatever your fear might be today, I'm inviting you to surrender it at the altar. I'm not calling you to the altar, but treat the space where you are seated today as the sacred altar of God. And surrender that fear to God in a time of prayer. Don't worry about public opinion. You come to God in that sacred space where you are. With all your fears. With all your regrets. With all your anger. With all your anxiety about tomorrow. And you take a page out of Joseph's book. And hear God speaking to your fears related to when people let you down. Hear God speaking to your fears related to all your worries about public opinion. Hear God speaking to your fears when you're stressed out, you're in mental anguish, you don't know what to do. Joseph's specific concerns was addressed by God in God's way, and God is going to address your concerns. We are believing God today, and we are believing with you that God will address yours in God's way. So, all in the sound of my voice, I just want us to pause for a moment. Because you have some fears, too. Let us talk to God. God, you know us by name, and you know us by nature. And you know the fears we face. And you know the pain we carry. You know the disappointments we have for when people let us down. People we thought would be there, they're not there now. And people we thought would lift us, they help to tear us down. You know our fears about public opinion? Because support we were looking for, we don't have. And we fear for our future. You know the mental anguish on our spirits? But you said, 
I will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on me. And we know, we know that you are able to do for us more than we can do for ourselves. We know that you are able to do for us abundantly, exceedingly, above all that we ask of him. So even as Joseph gave you all those fears, today we name them before you. One, two, three, four, five. Whatever they are, we name them. And we give them to you. And we say, have thine own way, Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I wonder if we could join the organ in singing that hymn, Have Thine Own Way. Have thine own way. But it's 382 in the hymn now. going to say a prayer for the blessing of the offering. And following that, we'll have the final song by, led by the representative from the United Choir, Silent Night. That's going to be the final song. So let's say the offering prayer right now. Let's pray. God of our salvation, accept our tithes and offering this day as a gift of worship to you, 
Multiply what we give for the effective growth of your kingdom. May Christ dwell in our hearts through faith so that we, being rooted and grounded in love, may have the strength to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. May we be filled with the fullness of God. We pray in the holy name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. Is the final song Silent Night? So Monica and Ozzy, come and help Ralph sing, lead it to the singing of Silent Night, and the rest of us will stand and join and sing Silent Night. number is it? I think that's 239 in the hymnal, right? 239 in the hymnal, but it's on the board so we can see it. We'll sing along. Tender and mild 
Son of God came into the world. Let us, his brothers and sisters, go into the world, giving thanks for life in word and deed, and growing in love for God and neighbor. Go in peace, and may the peace of God go with you. Amen. <laughs>